try to apply this to the times in your life, like what Darlene said, or anything else that's happening in your life. Your son is rebelling. Your, your, whatever is happening, it is meant for good. It doesn't matter that it's painful. It doesn't matter that... I, I know I'm kind of getting sermony here, and that's not what I mean to do, but try to read the life of Joseph and apply it to your own life, because it does help. These are written in here not only to point us to Jesus Christ, but to show us that this happens throughout the ages to all people. They are in here, as it says, this is for our instruction. This is for our good. And all of these words have a purpose, not only specifically, but non-specifically. Not explicitly, but also implicitly. So apply these lessons to your life and know that what is happening to him is also happening to you. It's because God has a plan and a purpose for you. But you have to recognize that. People that are out there that have exactly the same thing happen and don't recognize it will just suffer in their lives and they're going to go off into eternity blaming God for something that they could have given Him glory for. Now, let me give you one quick example. I won't divert any more than this. I knew a, a, a guy that, he was a pastor over at the church I used to attend, Pastor Ross, and he had a friend... Um, may have been his friend's friend. Anyway, he spoke at the church and they had a child that died. And they understood after that happening what their goal was or their mission was is because people would get a call. They'd get a call at night. Somebody lost a son or a daughter. And they'd call them any time of the day or night and they'd say, we need you down in Alabama. Because, you know, independent fundamental Baptist churches are a real tight-knit bunch. Anyway, that's what this guy did. He was there using his own bad circumstances to help other people and to say, we know what you've gone through, we know what you're going to go through. And God used what happened to them for good. And they understood that. And because of that, their outlook on the death of their own son was much, much different than the outlook of somebody else who loses a son and says, God must be just terrible, right? We have a choice in how we handle hardship and how we handle our life experiences. Enough preaching, go ahead. Mm. It was really a freak car accident. Oh, man. The car went from one side of the interstate to the other side in a wind. Oh, man. So I said it was just freak, and they used their lives that same way. Good. So Good. Because you know what? If you can do that, then that shows that you have faith that's deeper than just, mm -hmm. you know. You know, some people say they have faith, and they do. It may be small, but the more that you can appreciate those things, the more the Lord will reward you because everything that we get is going to be based on faith. It's not going to be based on what we do. Our works are our faith. I, I, I just, I, there's no way to disassociate the two. Anyway, go ahead. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was not there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, the boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? Then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, Dip the robe in the blood. Okay, what does it say at the crucifixion? He says, well, well, afterward, what did the Jewish people say? Let his, let his blood be upon us. And here they are making an analogy of that right now. They're, they're making blood guilt right now by what they're doing. Okay, so kind of a little parallel of that. One thing I want to back up to is in verse 28, it said, then Midianite traders passed by. Okay, Midianites were a group of the Ishmaelites. They are Midian, the son of uh, Ishmael. Okay, just so you know that. There's not a contradiction or anything that they are Ishmaelites, but through the son of Ishmael. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yes. No. Okay, then they got Joseph's robe, slaughtered a goat, and dipped the robe in the blood. They took the ornamented robe back to their father and said, We found this. Examine it to see whether it is your son's robe. He recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. Some ferocious animal has devoured him. Joseph has surely been torn to pieces. Imagine, oh, just, I can't read this part, you know, the, the, the suffering that Jacob went through. Every time I read it, and then later he's going to say something before he sends Benjamin down to Egypt, and I, it breaks my heart every time I read it. 
every time. But this here, you know, he really loved this son. Despite being favoritism and, you know, not being the father that he probably should have been, you know, and his whole life was, you know the meaning of Jacob, don't you? is a heel grabber, which is an idiom for deceiver. And his whole life he'd been deceiving people, and then he gets deceived several times. He got deceived coming back. He got, he's getting deceived right now. He's getting, I don't want to call it just desserts, but he's getting what happened to him, what he did to others, he's getting to him. But it doesn't negate the sadness of this guy's heart at what happened here. Very, very sad. Then Jacob tore his clothes put on sackcloth and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters came to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, in mourning will I go down to the grave to my son. So his father wept. Okay, and you know what? He would have gone to his grave in mourning because he was still bearing it when he sent Benjamin away, which means he, he was mourning until he found out that his son was alive. And you, know, you all know this story, so I'm not giving anything away, but <sighs> unbelievable. I just unbelievable that, you know, he just could never get to the point where he was over what had happened. Okay, go ahead. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. Okay, the word there, Midianites, is not Midianites. The word there is Medianites. Okay, just so you know, they change it in the translation because they don't want people to get confused. It goes from Midianites to Medanites. Medan is another son of Ishmael. It doesn't mean there's a contradiction. It means that they were probably traveling together, and one of the Midianites got him and says, well, I'll sell him to you for 25 shekels of silver, or whatever. We made five bucks off of our brother. So now a Medianite has sold him. Just so you know that the word is Medanite there. Okay, and it's probably footnoted in many of your Bibles. If you look there, there's probably a little something there that says that. If not, just so you know, that's in the Masoretic text. Other texts, like the Septuagint, I believe, will say Midianite. Because somewhere along the line, somebody got scared and says, well, we don't want a contradiction. No contradiction. Just because something says a different name doesn't mean there's contradiction. It means somebody hasn't thought something through. They're all brothers, and they're probably traveling together. So, you know, anyway, just so you know, that's what it says in the Masoretic text. In other texts, it'll say Midianites both times, just so you're aware of that. Okay, we're on, and we got, what time is it? Yeah, we got time. Chapter 38. Boy, we did a whole chapter in a day. I have a footnote on the officer. Do you want to hear it? On the officer? Yes. Oh, Potiphar. Okay, please. Um, in charge of police, chief of the butchers, a term that fitted the duties of this man. A person offended, if a person offended one of the eastern despot, despot rulers, it was the duty of such guards to destroy the offender without giving them a trial. Potiphar's duty was to take care of Phaetok and execute his will on all subjects of his displeasure. Huh. Huh. Never knew that. That must be that so when the somebody displeases the Pharaoh, he's the he's the handyman. Huh. I have no idea. Well I'll have to read up on that. Thank you. Huh. Okay, uh thirty eight one anybody? Please start reading. Start 38. 38. Anybody wants to read, please. I'm sorry, that was the captain of the guard, not the officer. Okay. The captain of the guard. Good. Okay. This print is so small, I need to go to the bathroom. That's all right, I do too. <laughs> and they're getting worse all the time. All right, anybody, 38 1. It came about at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira. Hira. Okay, remember what I said? We're talking about Joseph, and all of a sudden, Joseph just disappears. Because what's happening to him now will be explained a little bit later, but it's also not important to the context of what's going on. We have an insert here. It goes to Judah, okay? That's the fourth son, right? Yes. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son... And he named him Er. Er. Okay, now, while we're talking about this, I want you to know that it's going to get a little graphic. 
in this particular chapter, so if you don't like graphic, I'm just letting you know in advance. And um, uh, it, it just does. And um, uh, it, remember what Esau did. Who did he marry that displeased his fathers, his father and mother? He married Canaanites, okay? Ur is doing the same thing. He's marrying a Canaanite woman. And it, it was understood within this clan that, that they are not the great people that we should be marrying. And that goes back to Genesis 15 where it says the sins of the Amorites have not... Well, obviously they are sinning people or he wouldn't have said that to them. So what Judah is doing is kind of rebellion, all right? And this goes also to the New Testament where Paul says don't marry outside of the faith. doesn't explicitly say that in the verse that most people quote which is um, do not be unevenly yoked, okay? That's not specifically talking about that. It's talking about another issue, but you can apply it to that. You can apply it to business partnerships. But when Paul mentions a woman that loses her husband, she's allowed to marry again. He says, but only in the faith. So we are required as Christians to remain within the faith. And I won't say which one, but I've got, well, actually, I won't even get into it, but you got to remind your children that they need to ask first if somebody a Christian. Not after, you know, you, 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 oh, he's so handsome and you start dating and next thing you know, is he a Christian? That's always my first question in both of my children. Is this a Christian? I don't know. You need to ask this question first. You were raised in a Christian context. Even when your dad wasn't, they went to a Christian school. You ought to know better than this. And so then what does it do? It causes a wall between me and my son or daughter until they make a decision. You know, you can move out of this house or you can stop dating this person. That's all there is to it because you can't put this back in the face of the Lord. You can't do it, you know? And so far my children have been okay. My son is right now up in Maine doing his own thing, but um, keep that in mind. We all go through this. You know what? In my 24 and 23, and I'm still going through it. So we, we do go through these things, but you have to remind them. Your grandchildren, maybe your children aren't going to do that. Have, Take your grandchildren and talk to them. Say, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. Okay? That's what's going on here. The parents failed to do what they should have done. Okay, go ahead. Sorry to divert so much. And then, then she conceived again and bore a son and named him Onan. And she bore still another son and named him Shelah. And it was at Shezeb that she bore him. Now Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, his first, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Er, Judah's firstborn, was evil in the sight of the Lord, so the Lord took his life. Well, that's pretty explicit there. The Lord killed him. End of story. This guy was a wicked guy. He was doing what he shouldn't have done, you know, whatever. And uh, uh, Judah chose a wife for his daughter Tamar, okay? This is just what he did. He says, here's a wife for you, and she's also from the daughters of Canaan, okay? The guy's wicked, and the Lord killed him. Now, just so you know, all of this has a purpose. It has a reason why it's happening. God doesn't kill everybody that is wicked, but because it's going to meet his sovereign purposes, he takes the life of this person, okay? There are people all over the world that are wicked that the Lord is not killing. But because something is going to happen in this particular passage that we're reading, the Lord decided this is what I'm going to do to fulfill it. We'll divert for one second to the book of Ruth and say that everything about the book of Ruth, and we went through a Ruth study, Mary was there, um, Mary was at the, the one I did it uh, last year. Every name in the book of Ruth point somehow or another to Jesus. Every place they walk, every single thing they do, it is the most beautifully constructed thing in the world. But these are real people that had real life experiences. They really did the things that happened, but the Lord chose to work it out so that it would make a picture for us, okay? And this is kind of the same thing that's happening here. We look at it and we say, well, you know, it's not right that the Lord killed him. The Lord made him. As it says in the Old Testament and the New, what right does the clay have to say to the potter, why did you make me like this? We have no right at all. Whatever the Lord wants to do, if he stopped caring, we would cease to exist immediately. Every single 
Adam in this universe would disappear. Because it says in the book of Colossians and in uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says that by him all things sustain, all things hold together, NIV. 